thank you so much for that, Amanda. Um, you're very generous in your um, introduction. Um, I've taken the liberty of hijacking my brief in order to talk only to translation issues. But then I must also say that I'm not an expert on these issues either. I speak as a freelance translator who in a sense is outside of the translation machine to rephrase Gayatri Spivak, since I live in England, but engage with writers, publishers and universities mainly in India. Anyway, now I'm going to steer a course between Chris's prescriptive five-minute provocation and Amanda's generous invitation to do a much longer presentation and simply put before everyone here some observations about the translation scene in India and very particularly from Tamil into English, hoping that the consideration of the huge difference between what goes on there and here will in itself be a provocation. It's a nice comment. Let me, let me begin with the context then. The current boom in translation, because that's what it is from the Indian languages, uh, literatures into English, and between them, has a very particular history. First, there was a post-colonial consciousness of wanting to return to the literatures of one's mother tongue, Tamil or Bengali or any other of the 20 odd languages spoken in India. Rather than the English literature, which so far had been most valued and taught in schools and universities. And then there was an extension of this project of re examining cultural identity, that is, a post independence consciousness of inheriting a mother tongue and a foreign father tongue, as well as belonging to this multilingual and multilateral media. And this was really very exhilarating in the post-independence days. Just by way of example, reading the English version of Tagore's great novel, Gola, published by Macmillan as early as 1924, was qualitatively a very different experience from reading, say, Jane Austen or George Eliot. One read Gola with the thrill and shock of recognition knowing that it spoke both of a particular Bengali experience as well as a pan-Indian one, and yet was accessible to most of us only through translation. Now, the Indian publishers who took the place of the British who left gradually after 1947 were sensitive to this emerging new reading culture and began to publish modern and contemporary Indian texts in English translation. And then two more important things happened. In the 1960s, there were some translations, um, the, the great ones, um, the, the uh, translation of Pater Panchali, a beautiful translation of Chen Mi um, from the Malayalam. These very quickly became models for us, um, uh, models in translation. And at the same time, round about this time, <laughs> the 1960s, a very self-confident Indian writing in English uh, uh, became established, providing for us a model of the kind of language into which one might translate um, Indian language texts. So, um, so now fast forward to contemporary times and some observations about the texts that are translated now, today, from Tamil into English. Um, and in a way, you can't separate that. You can only judge that by what, is, what you see published. So, some surprises here, perhaps. Um, first, the maverick one, the classical texts. And yes, these do continue to be translated and read. Um, the inspiration and role model for this was A.K. Ramanujan, himself a poet, who translated the early Bardic poetry, known as Sangam poetry, and the medieval devotional lyrics of Canada and Tamil, and who set going a new model of translating poetry. Um, he used, for example, a modern diction, but he took liberties with the topography of the poem on the page in order to bring out the order and syntax of its images and themes rather than its actual phrase order, for example. 
So, um, so he has been followed by um, some of his own students, Indian and American, um, and although these um, are producing very many good modern translations, I'm very delighted that Priya is working on Andal at the moment. Unfortunately, these mainly address an academic readership. Um, only Ramanujan's translations so far have had a universal appeal, even managing a Monday you will remember to be displayed in the London underground. Um, the rest of the translation enterprise in India, I think of rather like the tracing of different sorts of literary maps, plotting different kinds of literary histories, but also working perhaps towards a composite map of what we might rather terrifyingly call modern Indian literature. And this may be the place for me to talk a little bit about the Sahitya Academy, the National Academy of Letters, which has one of the largest programs for the publication of literatures and translation. Um, it, uh, the Sahitya Academy was launched in 1954 with a clearly stated political and cultural aim. It says to foster and coordinate literary activities in all the Indian languages and to promote through them the cultural unity of India. Um, and you should remember that the boundaries of the Indian states were being redrawn in the early 1960s. And there's a lot of um, quarrels, language rights even. People talked about physicalist tendencies, I remember. So this, this, this political um, subtext here uh, is very, um, very important. Um, Crucial to Sahitya Academy's concerns is to make the literatures in the 22 plus official languages available to each other through translation. And uh, since 1960, English has been included among those. Um, it works like this. Each language has, a, has an advisory board um, who work to their own program of translation and publication, but will make a recommendation every year for an award. Um, this winning book will then be translated into all the other languages. Um, Minakshi Mukherjee, who has single-handedly done for translation everything, who was chair to the advisory board for English for one term, tells me that there's no single policy across the languages, nor even necessarily a continuing policy within each language, since each board sits for the duration of five years only. So the translation programs tend to be ad hoc. And this may well be a good thing, I think. Um, and if it was the aim of Sahitya Academy to create some sort of canon nationally, thankfully that hasn't actually happened. Um, however, uh, the, the awards are prestigious and help to create a reading public. The thing about um, Sahitya Academy, too, is that um, they, there is very poor publicity for their books. You can hardly get hold of them. They're produced in a very, um, not very attractive fashion, either. So really, it is up to the, the private, the commercial um, publishers to take translation forward in a more accessible way. And I do see a sort of unstated project there to discover and translate modern languages from different Indian languages, which, of course, in practice works in a random and piecemeal 